Chapter Fourteen of the Legends of King Arthur and His Knights by James Nobles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen: The War Between King Arthur and Sir Lancelot, and the Death of King Arthur. Within a while thereafter was a jousting at the court wherein Sir Lancelot won the prize and two of those he smote down were sir agravaine the brother of sir gawaine and sir modred his false brother king arthur's son by bellicent and because of his victory they hated sir lancelot and sought how they might injure him so on a night when king arthur was hunting in the forest and the queen sent for sir lancelot to her chamber they too espied him and thinking now to make a scandal and a quarrel between lancelot and the king they found twelve others and said sir lancelot was ever now in the queen's chamber and king arthur was dishonoured then all armed they came suddenly round the queen's door and cried traitor now art thou taken madam we be betrayed said sir lancelot yet shall my life cost these men dear then did the queen weep sore and dismally she cried alas there is no armour here whereby ye might withstand so many wherefore ye will be slain and i be burnt for the dread crime they will charge on me but while she spake the shouting of the knights was heard without traitor come forth for now thou art snared better were twenty deaths at once than this vile outcry said sir lancelot then he kissed her and said most noble lady i beseech ye as i have ever been your own true knight take courage pray for my soul if i be now slain and trust my faithful friends sir bors and sir lavaine to save you from the fire but ever bitterly she wept and moaned and cried would god that they would take and slay me and that thou couldst escape that shall never be said he and wrapping his mantle round his arm he unbarred the door a little space so that but one could enter then first rushed in sir chalance a full strong knight and lifted up his sword to smite sir lancelot but lightly he avoided him and struck sir chalance with his hand such a sore buffet on the head as felled him dead upon the floor then sir lancelot pulled in his body and barred the door again and dressed himself in his armour and took his drawn sword in his hand but still the knights cried mightily without the door traitor come forth be silent and depart replied sir lancelot for be ye sure ye will not take me and to-morrow will i meet ye face to face before the king ye shall have no such grace they cried but we will slay thee or take thee as we list then save yourselves who may he thundered and therewith suddenly unbarred the door and rushed forth at them and at the first blow he slew sir agravaine and after him twelve other knights with twelve more mighty buffets and none of all escaped him save sir modred who sorely wounded fled away for life then returned he to the queen and said now madam will i depart and if ye be in any danger i pray ye come to me surely i will stay here for i am queen she answered yet if to-morrow any harm come to me i trust to thee for rescue have ye no doubt of me said he for ever while i live am i your own true knight therewith he took his leave and went and told sir bors and all his kindred of this adventure we will be with thee in this quarrel said they all and if the queen be sentenced to the fire we certainly will save her meanwhile sir modred in great fear and pain fled from the court and rode until he found king arthur and told him all that had befallen but the king would scarce believe him till he came and saw the bodies of sir agravaine and all the other knights then felt he in himself that all was true, and with his passing grief his heart nigh broke. Alas, cried he, now is the fellowship of the round table for ever broken. Yea, woe is me, I may not with my honour spare my queen. Anon it was ordained that Queen Guinevere should be burned to death, 
because she had dishonoured King Arthur. But when Sir Gawain heard thereof, he came before the king, and said, My lord, I counsel thee, be not too hasty in this matter, but stay the judgment of the queen for a season, for it may well be that Sir Lancelot was in her chamber for no evil, seeing she is greatly beholden to him for so many deeds done for her sake and peradventure she had sent to him to thank him, and did it secretly that she might avoid slander. But the king answered, full of grief, Alas, I may not help her, she is judged as any other woman. Then he required Sir Gawain, and his brethren, Sir Gaharis, and Sir Gareth, to be ready to bear the queen to-morrow to the place of execution. Nay, noble lord, replied Sir Gawain, that can I never do for neither will my heart suffer me to see the queen die, nor shall men ever say I was of your counsel in this matter. Then said his brothers, Ye may command us to be there, but since it is against our will, we will be without arms, that we may do no battle against her. So on the morrow was Queen Guinevere led forth to die by fire, and a mighty crowd was there of knights and nobles, armed and unarmed, and all the lords and ladies wept sore at that piteous sight. Then was she shriven by a priest, and the men came nigh to bind her to the stake, and light the fire. At that Sir Lancelot's spies rode hastily, and told him and his kindred, who lay hidden in a wood hard by, and suddenly with twenty knights he rushed into the midst of all the throng to rescue her. But certain of King Arthur's knights rose up and fought with them, and there was a full great battle and confusion, and Sir Lancelot drave fiercely here and there among the press, and smote on every side, and at every blow struck down a knight, so that many were slain by him and his fellows. Then was the queen set free, and caught up on Sir Lancelot's saddle, and fled away with him and all his company to the castle of La Joyous Guard. Now so it chanced that in the turmoil of the fighting, Sir Lancelot had unawares struck down and slain the two good knights, Sir Gareth and Sir Gaharis, knowing it not, for he fought wildly and saw not that they were unarmed. When King Arthur heard thereof, and of all that battle, and the rescue of the queen, he sorrowed heavily for those good knights, and was passing wroth with Lancelot and the queen. But when Sir Gawain heard of his brethren's death, he swooned for sorrow and wrath, for he wist that Sir Lancelot had killed them in malice, and as soon as he recovered he ran into the king, and said, Lord King and uncle, hear this oath which now I swear, that from this day I will not fail Sir Lancelot till one of us hath slain the other. And now, unless ye haste to war with him, that we may be avenged, will I myself alone go after him. Then the king, full of wrath and grief, agreed thereto, and sent letters throughout the realm to summon all his knights, and went with a vast army to besiege the castle of La Joyous Guard. And Sir Lancelot with his knights mightily defended it, but never would he suffer any to go forth and attack one of the king's army, for he was right loath to fight against him. So when fifteen weeks were past, and King Arthur's army wasted itself in vain against the castle, for it was passing strong, it chanced upon a day Sir Lancelot was looking from the walls, and espied King Arthur and Sir Gawain close beside. "'Come forth, Sir Lancelot,' said King Arthur right fiercely, "'and let us two meet in the midst of the field.' "'God forbid that I should encounter with thee, Lord, for thou didst make me a knight,' replied Sir Lancelot. Then cried Sir Gawain, "'Shame on thee, traitor and false knights! Yet be ye well assured, we will regain the queen, and slay thee and thy company. Yea, double shame on ye, to slay my brother Gaharis unarmed, Sir Gareth also, who loved ye so well.' For that treachery, be sure, I am thine enemy till death. Alas, cried Sir Lancelot, that I hear such tidings, for I knew not I had slain those noble knights, and right sorely now do I repent it with a heavy heart. Yet abate thy wrath, Sir Gawain, 
for ye know full well i did it by mischance for i loved them ever as my own brothers thou liest false recreant cried sir gawain fiercely at that sir lancelot was wroth and said i see well thou art now mine enemy and that there can be no more peace with thee or with my lord the king else would i gladly give back the queen then the king would fain have listened to sir lancelot for more than all his own wrong did he grieve at the sore waste and damage of the realm but sir gawain persuaded him against it and ever cried out foully on sir lancelot when sir bors and the other knights of lancelot's party heard the fierce words of sir gawain they were passing wroth and prayed to ride forth and be avenged on him for they were weary of so long waiting to no good and in the end sir lancelot with a heavy heart consented so on the morrow the hosts on either side met in the field and there was a great battle and sir gawain prayed his knights chiefly to set upon sir lancelot but sir lancelot commanded his company to forbear king arthur and sir gawain so the two armies jousted together right fiercely and sir gawain proffered to encounter with sir lionel and overthrew him but sir bors and sir blamor and sir palamedes who were on sir lancelot's side did great feats of arms and overthrew many of king arthur's knights then the king came forth against sir lancelot but sir lancelot forbore him and would not strike again at that sir bors rode up against the king and smote him down but sir lancelot cried touch him not on pain of thy head and going to king arthur he alighted and gave him his own horse saying my lord i pray thee forbear this strife for it can bring to neither of us any honour and when king arthur looked on him the tears came to his eyes as he thought of his noble courtesy and he said within himself alas that ever this war began but on the morrow sir gawain led forth the army again and sir bors commanded on sir lancelot's side and they two struck together so fiercely that both fell to the ground sorely wounded and all the day they fought till night fell and many were slain on both sides yet in the end neither gained the victory but by now the fame of this fierce war spread through all christendom and when the pope heard thereof he sent a bull and charged king arthur to make peace with lancelot and receive back queen guinevere and for the offence imputed to her absolution should be given by the pope thereto would king arthur straightway have obeyed but sir gawain ever urged him to refuse when sir lancelot heard thereof he wrote thus to the king it was never in my thought lord to withhold thy queen from thee but since she was condemned for my sake to death i deemed it but a just and knightly part to rescue her therefrom wherefore i recommend me to your grace and within eight days will i come to thee and bring the queen in safety then within eight days as he had said sir lancelot rode from out the castle with queen guinevere and a hundred knights for company each carrying an olive branch in sign of peace and so they came to the court and found king arthur sitting on his throne with sir gawain and many other knights around him and when sir lancelot entered with the queen they both kneeled down before the king anon sir lancelot rose and said my lord i have brought hither my lady the queen again as right requireth and by commandment of the pope and you i pray ye take her to your heart again and forget the past for myself i may ask nothing and for my sin i shall have sorrow and sore punishment yet i would to heaven i might have your grace but ere the king could answer for he was moved with pity at his words sir gawain cried aloud let the king do as he will but be sure sir lancelot thou and i shall never be accorded while we live for thou hast slain my brethren traitorously and unarmed as heaven is my help replied sir lancelot i did it ignorantly for i loved them well and while i live i shall bewail their death 
but to make war with me were no avail for i must needs fight with thee if thou assailest and peradventure i might kill thee also which i were right loath to do i will forgive thee never cried sir gawain and if the king accordeth with thee he shall lose my service then the knights who stood near tried to reconcile sir gawain to sir lancelot but he would not hear them though at the last sir lancelot said since peace is vain i will depart lest i bring more evil on my fellowship and as he turned to go the tears fell from him and he said alas most noble christian realm which i have loved above all others now shall i see thee never more then said he to the queen madam now must i leave ye and this noble fellowship for ever and i beseech ye pray for me and if ye ever be defamed of any let me hear thereof and as i have been ever thy true knight in right and wrong so will i be again with that he kneeled and kissed king arthur's hands and departed on his way and there was none in all that court save sir gawain alone but wept to see him go though he returned with all his knights to the castle of la joyous guard and for his sorrow's sake he named it dolores guard thenceforth anon he left the realm and went with many of his fellowship beyond the sea to france and there divided all his lands among them equally he sharing but as the rest and from that time forward peace had been between him and king arthur but for sir gawain who left the king no rest but constantly persuaded him that lancelot was raising mighty hosts against him though in the end his malice overcame the king who left the government in charge of modred and made him guardian of the queen and went with a great army to invade sir lancelot's lands yet sir lancelot would make no war upon the king and sent a message to gain peace on any terms king arthur chose but sir gawain met the herald ere he reached the king and sent him back with taunting and bitter words whereat sir lancelot sorrowfully called his knights together and fortified the castle of benwick and there was shortly besieged by the army of king arthur and every day sir gawain rode up to the walls and cried out foully on sir lancelot till upon a time sir lancelot answered him that he would meet him in the field and put his boasting to the proof so it was agreed on both sides that there should none come nigh them nor separate them till one had fallen or yielded and they too rode forth then did they wheel their horses apart and turning came together as it had been thunder so that both horses fell and both their lances broke at that they drew their swords and set upon each other fiercely with passing grievous strokes now sir gawain had through magic a marvellous great gift for every day from morning till noon his strength waxed to the might of seven men but after that waned to his natural force therefore till noon he gave sir lancelot many mighty buffets which scarcely he endured yet greatly he forbore sir gawain for he was aware of his enchantment and smote him slightly till his own knights marvelled but after noon sir gawain's strength sank fast and then with one full blow sir lancelot laid him on the earth then sir gawain cried out turn not away thou traitor knight but slay me if thou wilt or else i will arise and fight with thee again some other time sir knight replied sir lancelot i never yet smote a fallen man at that they bore sir gawain sorely wounded to his tent and king arthur withdrew his men for he was loath to shed the blood of so many knights of his own fellowship but now came tidings to king arthur from across the sea which caused him to return in haste for thus the news ran that no sooner was sir modred set up in his regency than he had forged false tidings from abroad that the king had fallen in a battle with sir lancelot whereat he had proclaimed himself the king and had been crowned at canterbury 
where he had held a coronation feast for fifteen days. Then he had gone to Winchester, where Queen Guinevere abode, and had commanded her to be his wife, whereto, for fear and sore perplexity, she had feigned consent, but under pretext of preparing for the marriage, had fled in haste to London, and taken shelter in the tower, fortifying it, and providing it with all manner of victuals, and defending it against Sir Modred, and answering to all his threats that she would rather slay herself than be his queen. Thus was it written to King Arthur. Then in passing great wrath and haste he came with all his army swiftly back from France, and sailed to England. But when Sir Modred heard thereof, he left the tower, and marched with all his host to meet the king at Dover. Then fled Queen Guinevere to Amesbury to a nunnery, and there she clothed herself in sackcloth, and spent her time in praying for the king, and in good deeds and fasting. And in that nunnery evermore she lived, sorely repenting and mourning for her sin, and for the ruin she had brought on all the realm. And there anon she died. And when Sir Lancelot heard thereof, he put his knightly armor off, and bade farewell to all his kin, and went a mighty pilgrimage for many years, and after lived a hermit till his death. When Sir Modred came to Dover, he found King Arthur and his army but just landed, and there they fought a fierce and bloody battle, and many great and noble knights fell on both sides. But the king's side had the victory, for he was beyond himself with might and passion, and all his knights so fiercely followed him, that in spite of all their multitude, they drove Sir Modred's army back with fearful wounds and slaughter, and slept that night upon the battlefield. But Sir Gawain was smitten by an arrow in the wound Sir Lancelot gave him, and wounded to the death. Then was he borne to the king's tent, and King Arthur sorrowed over him, as it had been his own son. Alas, said he, in Sir Lancelot and in you I had my greatest earthly joy, and now is all gone from me. And Sir Gawain answered with a feeble voice, My lord and king, I know well my death is come, and through my own willfulness, for I am smitten in the wound Sir Lancelot gave me. Alas, that I have been the cause of all this war, for but for me thou hadst been now at peace with Lancelot, and then had Modred never done this treason. I pray ye therefore, my dear lord, be now agreed with Lancelot, and tell him that although he gave me my death wound, it was through my own seeking, wherefore I beseech him to come back to England, and here to visit my tomb, and pray for my soul. When he had thus spoken, Sir Gawain gave up his ghost, and the king grievously mourned for him. Then they told him that the enemy had camped on Barham Downs, whereat with all his hosts he straightway marched there, and fought again a bloody battle, and overthrew Sir Modred utterly. Howbeit he raised yet another army, and retreating ever from before the king, increased his numbers as he went till at the farthest west in Lyonnes he once more made a stand. Now on the night of Trinity Sunday, being the eve of the battle, King Arthur had a vision, and saw Sir Gawain in a dream, who warned him not to fight with Modred on the morrow, else he would be surely slain, and prayed him to delay till Lancelot and his knights should come to aid him. So when King Arthur woke, he told his lords and knights that vision, and all agreed to wait the coming of Sir Lancelot. Then a herald was sent with a message of truce to Sir Modred, and a treaty was made that neither army should assail the other. But when the treaty was agreed upon, and the heralds returned, King Arthur said to his knights, Beware, lest Sir Modred deceive us, for I in no wise trust him, and if swords be drawn, be ready to encounter. And Sir Modred likewise gave an order that if any man of the king's army drew his sword, they should begin to fight. And as it chanced, a knight of the king's side was bitten by an adder in the foot, and hastily drew forth his sword to slay it. 
that saw sir modred and forthwith commanded all his army to assail the kings so both sides rushed to battle and fought passing fiercely and when the king saw there was no hope to stay them he did right mightily and nobly as a king should do and ever like a lion raged in the thickest of the press and slew on the right hand and on the left till his horse went fetlock deep in blood so all day long they fought and stinted not till many a noble knight was slain but the king was passing sorrowful to see his trusty knights lie dead on every side and at the last but two remained beside him sir lucan and his brother sir bedivere and both were sorely wounded now am i come to mine end said king arthur but lo that traitor modred liveth yet and i may not die till i have slain him now give me my spear sir lucan lord let him be replied sir lucan for if it pass through this unhappy day ye shall be right well revenged upon him my good lord remember well your dream and what the spirit of sir gawain did forewarn ye betide me life betide me death said the king now i see him yonder alone he shall never escape my hands for at a better vantage shall i never have him god speed you well said sir bedivere then king arthur got his spear in both his hands and ran toward sir modred crying traitor now is thy death day come and when sir modred heard his words and saw him come he drew his sword and stood to meet him then king arthur smote sir modred through the body more than a fathom and when sir modred felt he had his death wound he thrust himself with all his might up to the end of king arthur's spear and smote his father arthur with his sword upon the head so that it pierced both helm and brainpan and therewith sir modred fell down stark dead to the earth and king arthur fell down also in a swoon and swooned many times then sir lucan and sir bedivere came and bare him away to a little chapel by the seashore and there sir lucan sank down with the bleeding of his own wounds and fell dead and king arthur lay long in a swoon and when he came to himself he found sir lucan lying dead beside him and sir bedivere weeping over the body of his brother then said the king to sir bedivere weeping will avail no longer else would i grieve for evermore alas now is the fellowship of the round table dissolved for ever and all my realm i have so loved is wasted with war but my time hieth fast wherefore take thou excalibur my good sword and go therewith to yonder waterside and throw it in and bring me word what thing thou seest so sir bedivere departed but as he went he looked upon the sword the hilt whereof was all inlaid with precious stones exceeding rich and presently he said within himself if i now throw this sword into the water what good should come of it so he hid the sword among the reeds and came again to the king what sawest thou said he to sir bedivere lord said he i saw nothing else but wind and waves thou hast untruly spoken said the king wherefore go lightly back and throw it in and spare not then sir bedivere returned again and took the sword up in his hand but when he looked on it he thought it sin and shame to throw away a thing so noble wherefore he hid it yet again and went back to the king what saw ye said king arthur lord answered he i saw nothing but the water ebbing and flowing o oh, traitor and untrue cried out the king twice hast thou now betrayed me art thou called of men a noble knight and wouldst betray me for a jewelled sword now therefore go again for the last time for thy tarrying hath put me in sore peril of my life and i fear my wound hath taken cold and if thou do it not this time by my faith i will arise and slay thee with my hands then sir bedivere ran quickly and took up the sword and went down to the water's edge and bound the girdle round the hilt 
and threw it far into the water and lo an arm and hand came forth above the water and caught the sword and brandished it three times and vanished so sir bedivere came again to the king and told him what he had seen help me from hence said king arthur for i dread me i have tarried over long then sir bedivere took the king up in his arms and bore him to the water's edge and by the shore they saw a barge with three fair queens therein all dressed in black and when they saw king arthur they wept and wailed now put me in the barge said he to sir bedivere and tenderly he did so then the three queens received him and he laid his head upon the lap of one of them who cried alas dear brother why have ye tarried so long for your wound hath taken cold with that the barge put from the land and when sir bedivere saw it departing he cried with a bitter cry alas my lord king arthur what shall become of me now ye have gone from me comfort ye said king arthur and be strong for i may no more help ye i go to the vale of avilion to heal me of my grievous wound and if ye see me no more pray for my soul then the three queens kneeled down around the king and sorely wept and wailed and the barge went forth to sea and departed slowly out of sir bedivere's sight the end recording by thomas rose